let's start with McCutcheon because I think you know this is um, this is uh, McCutcheon is going to have some real implications going forward, and not just because of the ruling itself. You know, uh, the other day uh, Charles Koch penned an op-ed in uh, the Wall Street Journal bemoaning the fact In a Jimmy that, Stewart voice, I believe, right? Yes, uh, <laughs> indeed. That's my understanding, anyways. Uh, yeah. That's the way he writes. He sits down with pen to paper, and he goes, Oh, oh Mary, I, I'm i trying to... <laughs> I knew I could get you started again. Yeah, I know. I know. I knew you were It's so that. easy. It's just so easy. So easy. And um, we will talk about uh, later. I read program. that tearful op-ed, and it definitely... It's you know it, it'll you better have a couple boxes of Kleenex next to you because it'll it'll pull those suckers right out. Well, I mean, and and you know, I don't. Uh, McCutcheon is one of those uh, rulings that is going to really, um, I think, define in many respects how the Koch brothers spend their money over the coming years. I mean, it's not like they haven't been able to figure out how to pour. Uh, 500 million into our elections. Uh, uh, you know, and and maybe more over the course of. Of over over time, but um, where Citizens United uh, essentially uh, said that uh, you you can allow for uh, unlimited amounts of giving to these so-called super PACs as long as they don't uh, confer with with candidates, which of course we know was a joke. And was built on this premise that it doesn't create even the perception of corruption of our political process. McCutcheon comes in and as a case and basically says, like, look, all this spending's already happened. You know, all this money's already floating out there. So when we constrict the total amount that may be given directly to candidates, not just to individual candidates, but across the board and to political parties, um, we are inhibiting speech because, and, and, and l- let me just out, uh, outline this for people in the past. The, the theory in the past was like, look, if money is speech and you're only allowed to give, let's say, I don't know, it was, I guess it was 48000 but let's say it's $50,000 uh, in 2000 dollars increments to each candidate, uh, each candidate across the, the board, maxing out. It's really, I think it's 2600 and it's 48, but whatever. Um, if you're really concerned about the the speech that's involved in showing your support for any individual candidate, you don't have to max out to each one of those, and you can spread it out to the 500 candidates that you uh, support by just diminishing the amount of money that you give to each. And McCutcheon basically says, well, no, that inhibits your free speech, too. You need to be able to give as much as you want to give. Uh, in uh, or it raises the aggregate limits, but the real problem here is that this is we know where we're headed with this Roberts Court. Yes, right? the, the next step is actually the much bigger problem than McCutcheon itself. Let me start by saying uh, the usual the disclosure that I do work on this issue for for Friends of Democracy, which is um, what you could call an ironic super PAC. We were ranked one of the least objectionable super PACs, by the way, along with Stephen Colbert uh, <laughs> by Mother Jones, because it was started by Jonathan Soros and the whole, no, well, what we were trying to do and what we were able to do last election cycle and working on this election cycle is electing people that are supporting public financing over those that wish to eliminate limits like McCutcheon uh, and, and things of that sort. So there's my disclosure, folks. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the the problem here is is that Citizens United essentially, you know, overturned 100 years since, you know, Teddy Kennedy, back when there were Republicans that cared about these things. Teddy Kennedy, excuse me, Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, came out uh, in, in banning corporate uh, contributions, uh, you know, in our process and opened up the floodgates and overturned, you know, again, massive, you know, overturned what the Supreme Court had found. To work, and then Buckley versus Vallejo was a 1976 decision that first sort of made this equating of money to speech, and that's where the problem started. And you could have an idea where we were going to end up here. Um, but you know, the bigger problem now is you. So you've done that with corporate money, and you've done that with these, you know, independent expenditures that where these guys don't coordinate, which is laughable. Um, but now, on on you know, it's bad enough that you're saying essentially that there was a hundred twenty-three thousand dollar limit that you could give to all your candidates and PACs, 
and you know before as if one hundred twenty three thousand dollars you know we all just have that kind of money lying around to to influence the system, so of course it's a real real limit on our speech. That was too much of a limit, these guys said. Um, so they opened it up now, so you there's no limit. And if you sit there and you game that out, you can get to $3.5 million about you can give. I haven't done the math on that, but that's about what you could give to to one party's you know, committees, PACs, individual candidates, federally, of course, in, in an election cycle. Although what these guys are going to do soon is, first of all, there's, there's state limits, right? Different states have different limits. You know, Ohio has a $12,000 limit you can give, which I personally think is too high, but at least it's a limit of some sort. They're going to work on those eventually. And then, of course, there's the federal limits that you were talking about, which is 2,600, you know, primary and then general, uh, 5,000 for PACs. And you should look at the leading indicator on this whole thing or, you know, where we're headed. It was the Clarence Thomas position, which was he wrote a dissent, even though he agreed with the, the other four corporate bought uh, guys on on the fact that uh, one hundred twenty three thousand dollars is way too much of a, a limit on your ability to speak um, that uh, now in the few you know he his dissent said that we should get rid of all limits so you know your son runs for office and you 're a billionaire and they run for let 's say Congress and it looks like it 's going to be a competitive race and suddenly you put four hundred million dollars into their into their uh, campaign account that 's where this is headed. That's where Clarence Thomas wanted to go. And just like how, you know, the thing about Roberts we always have to watch is he tries to keep the reputation of the court to need be not completely, you know, uh, in the dumps, although their approval rating as it should has been going down and down and down because it's so clear they're they're corrupt. But he does these sneaky things. He did it with the Affordable Care Act, where he didn't defend the Commerce Clause. He defended the Affordable Care Act's mandate on the ability of Congress to tax, Mm -hmm. so that he left it open purposely that the Commerce Clause could be assaulted eventually. And he's done the same thing here. He's purposely – Larry Lessig wrote a great piece for the Daily Beast. He purposely has defined corruption in a very, very sort of uh, straightjacketed it. Very narrow. So the corruption is literally an absolute quid pro quo. I give you this money, you vote A, B, and C for me. It's not the overall effect that this money has on our system. It's not the fact that when huge corporate donors are giving money, gee, I wonder what they want. Do the Koch brothers want environmental deregulation? Do people on Wall Street want to get rid of Dodd-Frank? These are not hard things to figure out. Uh, and so, they, so that's not corruption. To them, they're claiming after everything we've seen, after we've seen all these, these Republicans literally prostate themselves last week before Sheldon Adelson, who, a man who has said we should drop a nuclear bomb in the desert near Iran to scare them. That's, this is what, how this man thinks. Um, he, they had to all go literally beg him because there's a Sheldon Adelson primary now among Republicans running for president. So, yes, clearly that hasn't corrupted the system because I'm sure they're going in front of the other 310 million Americans and doing the same thing. Well, I mean, but, you know, I mean, that's the thing is that they're saying that uh, access and influence on politicians that is bought, that is bought, okay, because insofar as you're, you're, you're putting money into is not corruption, definitionally right. speaking. And that is the most narrow perspective. They, it's almost as if— It's like, also ahistorical, just to be clear, just like they're finding on Citizens United, just like they're finding on uh, you know, the, those f- four guys and what was left open by the fifth on you know, the Commerce Clause, just like they're finding on voting rights, I mean, the, you know, and they're finding on guns. Um, the, I mean, it's amazing because for anybody who's actually read the Constitution, the, 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 the founders, it's really not hard— to, to see people like James Madison talking about the danger of factions in Federalist 10. It's not hard to see in the Constitution and, and in many of their early writings, and Lessig talks about this too, their view of corruption. Their view of corruption was such that they had seen money corrupt government so much with King George that the main reason they did not want the capital of this country to be in New York is because they were scared of the financial capital and the political capital in the same city. Just their juxtaposition there mm-hmm. would create corruption. That is so far away from a quid pro quo. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I mean, obviously it, with the forms of communication they had back then in travel, if you put it far enough away, you prevented it somewhat from happening. Well, it's as, as know, if they and, don't believe in the concept that a democratic system could be corrupt. 
They believe that only individuals can be corrupt. That's why it has to be a quid pro quo. You know, you're giving money to this uh, candidate. He needs to get, you know, something uh, specific in return. And the, let's be the, clear, by the way, I, you know, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, Sam, but I, I'd be even careful to say they believe, because I don't believe most of these guys believe well, anything okay. except for in the power of the, you know, to me, the saddest thing about all this is there is a time, you know, where being a Supreme Court justice president, these kinds of things in American society, that was the, that was the just the high, the best thing you could do. That was the end. You know, Harry Truman left the presidency and went into near poverty. You know, breaking that tradition, Ronald Reagan where he did his $1 million speaking tour around Japan, and, and this will seem quaint to people now. People were just shocked by that. Oh, my God, how could he sell the office of the president? Well, we're long past that now. Right. And, and so the, the end goal isn't president anymore, Supreme Court justice. It's plutocracy. I mean, who knows who the hell any of these five guys are working for? Because right now, Clarence Thomas can have his wife working for Tea Party groups, not even write down and disclose the income that she's bringing in that affects cases before the court. He doesn't even get impeached for that. That's impeachable. He should have been impeached. And I'm not just saying that because I detest his views, because I wouldn't make the same argument for the other justices, you know, in that, at least yet. <laughs> we could get there. But I wouldn't as much as I detest their views because, you know, what he did, you know, was illegal. And he's still sitting there in the court. So who knows what's going on behind the scenes with these guys. But it's also, for especially some of the ones who are in their 60s and whatever, maybe they get done with being a Supreme Court justice in a couple of years, five years down the road or whatever, and then it's on to the speaking tour. It's on to the – I mean, they become, get to become plutocrats themselves. You know, And that's, that could be the end game. And that's the real – I mean, that's a big problem here too. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think you need to show that. I mean, because, look, they, they have a nice job, and they are, you know, uh, Scalia will go on all the duck hunts he wants to go on. He's living the life of a plutocrat. I mean, but, but I, I'll rephrase. They would have us believe that it is impossible to, definitionally speaking almost, to corrupt a democratic process. I mean, on one hand, okay, they have no problem with restricting people's ability to vote as they attack the Voting Rights Act. That is not sacrosanct. But the idea that you would be inhibited, that the, the, the idea that speech, it's an inhibition of speech as to um, you, the volume you're speaking, how loud you're right. talking is a function of how much money you're allowed to spend. Uh, and, and to allow the amount of speech that you are granted uh, is a function of how wealthy you are. Uh, right, and, and, and then that whole thing falls apart upon any scrutiny, too. I mean, and, and, and everyone should read, if you are inter enough interested in this, Justice Breyer's um, dissent, because it's brilliant, and he shows all the ways that their thinking is just completely stupid. Uh, it doesn't follow logically. And, I mean, when you, if you sit there and you accept that money is speech, then somebody, of course, then needs to make some, some pretty serious, you know, you, you need to tell me. I mean, if, if you know, where is it? So I guess I, I, an explicit, explicit quid pro quo, is, is then they're saying, is, is bribery, right? But nothing else is. So, I mean, in our society, really, there's a lot of bribery laws that we have that are based upon a much broader standard than that. I mean, right, theoretically, I should just be able to give all sorts of money to, to all sorts of people and all sorts of figures in power and all sorts of positions. I don't ask for anything immediately. Right. I mean, it, 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 over, it, mean it, it, it overturns the complete concept. Basically, it legalizes bribery. It's, so, it's such a stupid, utterly ridiculous standard. You know, on top of that, as you're pointing out right now, when you're talking about money equaling speech, well, you know, then, then you have to accept that, of course, this court, except for in the case of Bush versus Gore, because President Bush's equality rights were on the line, you know, the right to be president when he got fewer votes, that, that decision by Scalia that should never be applied to any future decisions because it was completely made up crap. Um, but here we're saying that there is no right. These guys don't respect the right to equality clearly because then apparently a lot of some people are allowed to have a lot more speech than others. Right. Some people have no speech. Other people have all the speech in the world. And that and you're saying that, that money decides that. I mean, it's just, the, you know, upon the sort of really simplest logic, the, the whole thing falls apart. It's ridiculous. And, you know, again, McCutcheon is bad. Don't get me wrong. But what's worst about McCutcheon is, is the groundwork the, the, it lays for going yes. forward. 